There is no substitute for finding true purpose. So how do we do it? Miracle appetite suppressant, health, wealth, love, and happiness. What is love? What is love? What is love? You're I didn't say it. Worst. It is exploited. The big, big pearl loves dippity doo, dippity doo. Cocaine, heroin, hallucinogens. To the most romantic day of their lives. Many people spend their lives in a state of almost permanent dissatisfaction. We're all looking for purpose, trying to sift through the noise, the distractions. What if we found it? What if our search was over? If hope was a promise? Because we have. It is. But this world is still searching. And this light only shines when we hold it out. joys about having our organic outreach conference every year is we have this amazing team of speakers that come in and our main stage speakers this year were phenomenal. I mean, across the board, they were all amazing. But the most amazing one, <laughs> we kept around for an extra day. And uh, so you better be really good after I said that. There you go. Uh, but we have the privilege of having one of those speakers stay. And Adam Barr has preached here before. I met Adam when he was in his last year of college. He came to our church as an intern, our church in Michigan as an intern, uh, growing as a pastor, growing as a leader, actually met his wife, Jen, at our church in Michigan, and then uh, so respected Sherry and I that he wanted to be so much like us that he had one son, two sons, three sons, and to show off, they had a fourth son. And so, uh, so Adam and Jen and their four boys live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and, and one of the things I want to say about Adam as he, as he brings the word today is there are some people when they communicate as a Christian that they communicate really well with a the church. They can connect with church people. And then there's people who can communicate really well with people outside the church, kind of connect with the world and understand culture and what's going on in the world. And there's a handful of people that I've seen that can take the church world and, and the, the culture of the world and bring them together to make sense of how this stuff fits together in our crazy world. And Adam is one of those people that just highly gifted in bringing together what the word of God says, and what the world needs to hear. And so would you join me in praying for Adam as he brings God's word. Lord, we pray right now that you would come upon Adam in a powerful way, fill him with your spirit, take the words he's prepared, ignite his heart, and speak to us. And we pray for ourselves, that our hearts and lives are ready to receive everything you wanna speak to us. Lord, let us see your truth this day, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Would you welcome Adam Barr? Thank you, thanks Kevin. It is uh, really good to be here with you. I've been looking forward to spending some time together with you. And, and as Pastor Kevin sits down, I just, I want to tell you something I think you probably already know. Uh, you guys are, are super blessed. Uh, not only do you have Pastor Kevin and Sherry, uh, there's a, an amazing pastoral team of this church. There's an incredible staff at this church, an incredible volunteers. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. They, they were shining over this last week. And, and because of their hard work, the Lord created an environment where God moved, God touched lives, and that's gonna have ripple effects uh, literally around the world. So why don't we just give, why don't you give your, your team a big thank you? God is so good, he's so faithful to us. Um, so I, I want you to imagine for a second that I stand up here today and I, 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 I tell you I am looking for incontrovertible truth for the existence of oxygen. And I'm a little bit of a skeptic, you know, so I'm not going to trust some scientific, you know, instruments that you bring to me and you show me. I want it right here. I want it right now. I want to know immediately uh, that oxygen is true. Oxygen actually exists. Uh, let me ask you a question. What would be the fastest way to convince me that oxygen actually exists? Yeah, take a breath, right? I had people in the first and second services all say, cut off your breath. And I'm like, really? We got some, we got some murderous people in the crowd. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it, it doesn't take much to prove that it's real because, you know, the very breath that I'm using to argue against or for the existence of oxygen demonstrates that it's there, demonstrates that it's real. Otherwise, I couldn't do it, right? 
We live in a world that wants to know, is truth real? Can truth be known? And as Christians this morning, we have an answer to that question. Isn't that good news? We have an answer to that question, and the answer to that question is yes, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the truth that makes any other truth possible. Jesus Christ is the light that enlightens our hearts and enlightens our minds. And we believe that if we have encountered Jesus, if we have Jesus, then we have everything that everyone is looking for in him. And if we don't, then friends, it doesn't matter how much we acquire, it doesn't matter how much we get in this world, we're never really gonna understand what life is all about. So what are we searching for? What are we looking for? As believers, we say what we're searching for, what we're looking for is found in Jesus Christ and in the light of his presence, everything else starts to make sense. Now this, this, this morning, we're gonna uh, learn more about that as we join Jesus. He's in the final moments of his earthly life before he goes to the cross. He's in a conversation with a Roman ruler named Pilate. And Pilate, we'll see in a few moments, is a man who doubts the very existence of truth, even as he stands in the presence of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. So what I want to do is invite you, if you have a Bible with you this morning, to pull it out, whether it's on your laps or on an app, uh, and, and open your Bibles to John chapter 18. You're also going to see the text on the screen uh, today, and I'm going to be reading John chapter 18. I'm going to be reading verses 33 through 38. So let's follow along together. This is what we read. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. This morning, as we unpack God's word together, this is what we're going to see, that Jesus reveals he is the source of truth and challenges us to embrace him. Would you say that with me? Jesus reveals that he is the source of truth and challenges us to embrace him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in wonder. Lord, that we can actually know that you are, you are the truth. And in, in fact, Lord, in knowing you, um, the rest of truth is illuminated. It becomes more real to us. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you that you are here with us this morning. We want to ask you in the, in the person of the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our hearts that we might receive what you have for us and we might live the lives that you have designed us for. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen and amen. So there are three important things that we see in this text that help point us to understanding who Jesus is and why Jesus is the truth that we are looking for. Let's look at each of these three things. First thing that we see is the question that matters most. One of the most important questions that we have to answer as we're investigating truth is this. Is my heart ready to receive it? Because you see, the truth and the search for truth can't really be divorced from the state of our hearts. The search for truth can't be divorced from the state of our hearts. And in this text, we see a three different examples of, of hearts that are, are actually gonna make it impossible for people to find truth. The first thing we see is, is, is Pilate, look at verse 33. Pilate went back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Pilate is, is, in, is, is facing Jesus from what is, is a position of superiority. 
Pilate thinks that he is the judge in this situation. Pilate thinks that he's the one who can declare life or death, innocence or guilt. Pilate thinks that he's the one who's going to be able to declare Jesus' identity. How many know that's pretty ironic? That's a little bit silly. You've got this guy who's operating in an outpost of the uh, Roman emperor, who's representing the Roman emperor in in Rome, and, and this guy thinks he's got the power when he is face to face with the God of the universe. Think about that just for a second. I mean, he's face to face with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who's existed uh, from eternity unto eternity, who called all things into being, whose power controls uh, the existence, not only of every single supernova, but everything down to the smallest quark he has in his sovereign control. And this guy sitting here thinks that he has the power over Jesus. He thinks he's superior to Jesus. A lot of people approach the search for truth in the very same way. They think that they're the ones in control, but you know what? We're not. Truth is bigger than us. If you try to approach truth and the search for truth from a position of superiority, you're not going to find it. We, we see something else. We see that, that some people approach the, the truth, the search from truth from a, a place of deep skepticism. Look at verse 38. Uh, what is truth, retorted Pilate. Now, there, there's different ways to ask that question, aren't there? You can ask the question kind of this way. What is the truth? You can ask that question as someone who really wants to know, as someone who really believes that the person you're asking that question might be able to tell you the truth. You can also ask that question kind of like, what's truth, right? And that's a totally different way to ask that question. You're asking the question as someone who doubts the very existence of truth in the first place. Pilate doesn't ask that question, what is truth, as someone who believes it's really even possible to know it. You know, Christianity does not have a problem with tough questions. Christianity uh, doesn't even have a problem with doubts. Some of Jesus' own disciples struggled with doubt. Sometimes it's our questions and our doubts that lead us to a deeper love for God, a deeper appreciation of him. I know in my own life, as someone who loves to ask questions from the time I've been a little kid, it's my questions that have often led me deeper into the truth. The question is, do we ask those questions as someone who's confident that God has answers, or do we ask those questions as someone who is skeptical as to whether answers are even possible? A third thing that we see uh, is is that there's actually, there's another group of people here that display another kind of dangerous state of the heart. In verse 35, uh, Pilate is speaking to Jesus, and he says, your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. Pilate is, is, is speaking one-on-one with Jesus, but there's another group of people who are involved in this whole thing. There's another group of people who are, or who are involved in, uh, in Jesus being put on trial. And, and ironically, it's the religious leaders of Jesus' day. It's the people who should be the most poised to understand who Jesus is, to recognize who he is, and to receive him as their long-awaited Messiah. And yet it's those very people who are unable to see Jesus. For hundreds of years, God had given Israel a revelation that in the Old Testament that was preparing the hearts of the people to receive the Messiah when he finally came. And yet when, when the Messiah shows up on the scene, the people who have studied that revelation the most are absolutely blinded to who Jesus is. Have you ever thought about that? It just blows my mind. The danger is when we believe that the knowledge we have is sufficient. These religious leaders believed that they had all that they needed. They lived in an attitude of radical self-righteousness that didn't think they needed anything. This guy had to give, even when that person was God's greatest gift to humanity. Those attitudes make it difficult, if not impossible, to discover truth. But there's another way to approach truth, and it's as someone who's an honest seeker. If we approach God as a seeker, Jesus promised that we can find truth, and we will. He says, ask, and and the door will be open. Seek, and you will find, right? Right? That's the promise of God to us today. And so we need to come on our search for truth. And this just doesn't matter if you're someone who's not really a Christian, who's investigating the claims of Jesus Christ, or if you've been a Christian for like 30 years, 
and you want to go deeper in your Christian faith, there are certain attitudes of the heart that are absolutely required if you want to find the truth. The, f- the first thing that you have to have if you want to find the truth is you've got to have, you've got to, you've got to be hungry. You've got to be hungry for truth if you want to find the truth. Anybody uh, besides me love the boss, love Bruce Springsteen, right? He's saying everybody's got a hungry heart. I'm not going to sing it for you this morning. You would love it if I did, but I'm not going to because I'm not here to do a concert. I'm here to preach the word. So uh, he said everybody's got a hungry heart, but you know what? That's not always true. The fact is, is sometimes our hearts are full. Our hearts are full with things of this world. And you know what? When your heart is full, you can't always experience the hunger that comes with seeing the feast that is Jesus Christ. It's just like regular life. I mean, it, it, you can lay out a beautiful five-star meal, and if someone comes to the table and their belly is full of In-N-Out burgers, how many of you know they're not going to be too enthusiastic about that meal? Right? Whereas if you are starving, if you are hungry enough, a hot pocket might even taste delicious. <laughs> right? Jim Gaffigan notwithstanding. I mean, that's just, that's just the truth. You've got to come with a hungry heart. You've got to hu- come with a heart that is humble. I'm always amazed when people want to know the truth about all things. They want to know the transcendent truth that explains the mysteries of the universe. And yet they expect that truth to fit in their tiny little conceptual boxes. I can't believe how often I hear people say things like, well, my God would never say this. My God would never do that. I can't believe that God would, you know, we build these little boxes around who God is and we expect him to fit inside those boxes. You know, if the God of the universe decides to show up on the scene, how many know he's going to blow up your boxes? (laughs) We got to be humble enough to know that and believe that and understand that. Finally, we got to be honest. If you want truth, if you want to find the truth, you got to be someone who's honest enough to admit that sometimes you don't want to know the truth. Because truth can sometimes hurt. Can I get an amen? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, I'm a pastor. Sometimes my, I, I'll be honest with you, I get busy, and so sometimes my weight kind of does this. And then, and then I get back in shape, and then it does this. And I, I know what it's like to walk into the bathroom sometimes, and, and I see that scale sitting there, and it looks like a curled-up snake on the floor, and I don't want to get close. And then I, I finally I walk over, and I, I step onto it, and you, you kind of hold the wall, maybe take a couple pounds off. <laughs> and then you move your hands, and you look down, and you're like, man, someone broke this scale. Right? We don't want to be honest with ourselves, but, but friends, we've got to be honest with ourselves if we want the honest truth. So the first thing that we see in this text is that the state of our hearts will have a massive impact on whether or not we get to encounter truth. Second thing that we're going to see is that God, in his amazing grace, has moved heaven and earth to reveal truth to us. God has done everything that needs to be done for us to understand, for us to receive the truth. Look back in the text again. Look at verse 37. Jesus is speaking with Pilate, and Jesus says this in verse 37. He says, the reason I was born. Everyone say, the reason I was born. So in other words, Jesus is about to give us his mission statement, so pay attention. He's going to say, this is why I, I came into this world. He says, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Now, we didn't have time to read John 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up through to verse 18. So we don't necessarily have all the context of the verse this morning. So let me give you a little piece of context to understand this, what I just read. In the very first chapter of John, we read this. In the beginning was the word. He's speaking about the son of God. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was was God. Wait, wait a second. How does the word was God fit with I was born? Think about that for a second. What do we believe as Christians? We believe that 
The, the God who is everywhere, the God who knows everything, the God who is all powerful, the God who exists from eternity to eternity, the God who cannot be uh, depicted in art, the God who is spirit, that very God took to himself flesh and blood. He was a tiny little baby born, in, born to a mother, laid in a manger. He grew up. He lived his life. He suffered. That very God exists and he stands here face to face with Pilate. Think about that. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. The God of the universe took on flesh and blood and he came into this world. Friends, think about this. God could have delivered to us a philosophy of life, right? God could have delivered to us a moral system and said, now fulfill fulfill these laws and eventually you might make it to heaven. God didn't do that. God said, I'm going to come down into this world myself. I'm going to cross the great divide between divinity and humanity, between creature and creator, between eternity and the time-space world. I'm going to step into this world, and I'm going to share my very self with sinful humanity. I'm going to take the sins of that humanity on my shoulders, and I'm going to save that humanity for my purposes. Woo! If you don't get an amen on that, I'm going to be in trouble. Is that good news this morning? Now, what does that mean, okay? Oh, thank you, pastor. Lots of doctrine, lots of theology. That's interesting stuff. Uh, Two years ago, my wife and I were planning on um, a a little trip for my 40th birthday. It was going to be in March. We were going to leave the cold, frigid winter of Michigan for some place warm and nice. And I'm gonna be honest with you, the, the months leading up to that trip had been packed. We had I mean, a lot going on in our church, a lot going on in our lives, a lot going on with our family. So I'm like, I'm like uh, that, that vacation is kind of my finish line. Ever, anybody ever have one of those vacations where it's like, if I can just make it to that moment, everything's gonna be beautiful. And I, well, I was coming up to that vacation, I'm looking forward to it. And two days before we're going on vacation, I land in the ER with a fairly significant medical emergency. And as they're uh, looking at this, we find out real quickly, I'm not, we're, we're not going on our, our fun vacation. And so they, they, they begin to look around, and as they're scanning to handle this one problem, they discover another problem. And so my wife and I find ourselves in the office of a doctor whose specialty, area of specialty, is liver cancer. How many of you know that the world kind of shook for me a little bit, just sitting there? And the first thing he says to me is, you don't have cancer. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Good news, right? And he says, but you do need surgery. You have a very rare growth on your liver. We're going to have to take out part of your liver, and and so we, we need to prepare you for that. I'm like, okay. Now, add this little wrinkle to the thing. A a month following what he told me was probably going to be my surgery date, I was scheduled to come out and see you guys. uh, Kevin and Sherry and I had planned a trip. We were going to come out here. I was going to preach out here, and I was going to bring my oldest boy. It was going to be a special trip, right? I've already lost the Mexico trip, and now we have this trip. But I'm convinced we're going to be able to make it work. So I say to the doctor, I say, say, so so what's the incision going to look like on this this surgery? Is it going to be kind of like this? And he goes, "Uh uh-uh, more like this. I kind of took a deep breath, and I thought, well, I'm a quick healer. (laughs) I called Kevin up. Kevin, don't worry about it. We're going to make it out. He says, no, no, you're not. He says, you're going to need to stay home, and you're going to need to get better. And he was right. I went in for the surgery. We had the surgery. I'm still in the hospital for five days after. I have a scar, a beautiful scar from right here to about right here now. And they take out a sixth of my liver. And, and I'm in the hospital. Finally, they get me good enough I can get up. And I go home. I get home. I'm at home for a few days. And, and, the, and pain just keeps building, building, building. They finally realize I have a massive infection. They bring me back into the hospital after a few days being at home, five days being at home. And I'm in the hospital for another week while they're trying to get rid of this infection. Finally, a week, after a week of antibiotic treatments and all sorts of pain medications. They let me back out again. And less than a week later, someone's got to preach on Sunday. And yours truly, 
who has a master's degree in stupid. Am I right, Kevin? <laughs> I have a doctorate, he says. <laughs> Thank you. I'm standing in the pulpit of my church, preaching. That was dumb. And the next week, and the next week, and the next week. And, and I'm back again in just the normal things of life. And I haven't, haven't been on a trip. So we, we're finally, our family's coming up a few weeks later on what's going to hopefully be a restful trip. But the, here's a problem. I haven't slept very well for weeks. Anybody ever go through that kind of struggle, trial? And i got to be honest with you. The day before we're supposed to leave on this trip, I find myself in the closet of our bedroom, curled up in a ball, crying like a baby. <laughs> I'm not a real weepy person. But in that moment, I knew what it meant to hit the bottom of the barrel. Anybody ever been there? Now, what do you do when it seems like life is falling apart? Would it help you if I came in then and said, let me give you a few little philosophical axioms? No. Friends, it's in moments like these that we realize just what it means for the truth not simply to be an idea, but for the truth of all things to be a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. It's at moments like these that we realize just how much it means to say with the words of Paul that Jesus is before all things and in him. Everyone say, in him. Amen. Say it like you mean it. Amen. In him, all things hold together. It's in moments like these that we realize the beauty that the God who is the author of truth himself took on flesh and blood, walked in our shoes, received the penalty that we deserve for our sin, and rose again. That God who is truth dwells in us through his Holy Spirit. And in those moments of difficulty, in those moments of trial, we realize that truth it's personal. Truth is a person. It's not just an idea. Truth is what holds us together. Truth is what gives us the power to stand up again. Truth is what allows us to move forward with our lives. Truth, <laughs> truth is what keeps it all together. And truth is Jesus. Is that good news this morning? God doesn't just share the truth. He comes as the truth, reveals himself to us. Finally, last thing we want to see, that we all face a challenge. We all face a challenge when we come face to face with Jesus. Look at the second half of the verse I just read, verse 37. So Jesus says he came to testify the truth. Last thing he says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. That's what we call an exclusive truth statement. That means anything that disagrees with what Jesus said isn't true. Jesus says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. We live in a world that doesn't really respect or appreciate exclusive truth statements. In fact, we live in a world where people really want to say that, you know, this religion over here has a little piece of the truth, and this religion over here has a little piece of the truth, and this religion has a little piece of the truth, and we just all need to be humble enough to accept that. But friends, Jesus won't let us do that. Ever hear the, the myth of the three blind men? And the elephant, that's often used to explain this, right? Like there's these three blind men and they're brought up to an elephant and they're said, we want you to describe what an elephant is. And the first blind man is led over to the tusk and he touches it and he says, it's smooth, it's sharp, it's like a sword. The other is brought to the elephant's leg. He says, it's rough and it's strong, it's like a tree. Uh, the, the third one is brought to the tail. He says, it's, it's supple and it's smooth and flexible. An elephant must be like a snake. That's what religion is like, we're told. But friends, Jesus blows all those categories out of the water. Just imagine for a second if the elephant could talk. <laughs> Would that change the investigation of the three blind men? No, 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 but you guys got it wrong. Right? You know, you, you only have a piece of it. Friends, we believe that in Jesus Christ, the God of the universe has spoken truth into this world. We are not like blind people searching our way towards God. We are like people who's, who, have, who, have been, who have had the light of truth shown into our hearts through God himself who has revealed himself into the world. That is good news this morning. 
We're not stuck blindly hoping to find our way to God. God himself has come into this world, and that's exactly what Jesus tells us. Now, let me, let me try to wrap this up with a couple questions. Number one, have I recognized just how far God has gone to show me his truth? Do I really get it? When I think about what God has done to show me his truth, do I really get it? Tuesday morning, I got up early to come here. I hopped on my plane in Grand Rapids, caught what I thought was gonna be my connecting flight in Dallas. I get on the plane. Everybody knows I said thought was gonna be my connecting. Got, got on the plane in Dallas. We, we, we pull out on the tarmac and the, and the pilot comes on. Uh, uh, we, we got a little bit of a problem. Everybody just hang tight, it's gonna be okay. And we wait and wait. Wait, he gets on again. Uh, it looks like we've got a broken fuel pump. Someone's coming out of here to get that fixed for us. No big deal. We're going to have it fixed, and we're going to be up in the air in no time. We wait, and we wait. Finally, uh, we're going to have to pull back up to the gate, and they're going to fix the fuel pump there. Finally, it's, uh, we're not going to be able to fix the fuel pump. <laughs> <laughs> so we pull off the plane, and, and we, we wait and wait and we get on another plane. Finally, we, we get there and I, finally we land in San Jose and we land in San Jose and we get off the plane and I go and I wait for about an hour, hour and a half in a, in a line waiting to get my rental car and finally I get up to the rental desk. I pull up my credit card. I pull out my license. I lay them down and I say, can I please have the car that, that I reserved weeks ago? And, and they, they look at me and they say, oh, Mr. Barr, yeah, we canceled your reservation. You're late. I don't need you to tell me that. <laughs> Everybody know what this is? It's the world's smallest violin playing My Heart Cries for You, right? Oh, poor Adam. I mean, we've all had trouble, tra travel problems. Can I tell you something? N at no point in, that, in the course of those events did I think, I don't want to go to Monterey. Do you want to know why? This is going to make you feel good. Because I wanted to see you guys. It's true. I wanted to hang out with you people and, and be with some good friends, man. So that, was, that made all the, the headaches of travel worth it. You know what? Our little, our little troubles and travels mean, are, are nothing in comparison with what the God of the universe has done. He left his throne in heaven. He set aside his crown. He came down into this world. He took on humanity. He entered into a world of brokenness and sin as the God who is perfect, and he accepted it, and he understood it. Why? What motivated him to keep going? Friends, we don't need to wonder. We can know. For God so loved you, and God loved me. Say that with me. God Love me. He loves you this morning and he came into this world to show you that truth. Second question. This is the last one. I'll close with this. Am I willing to let my life be transformed by truth? Friends, the light of truth has dawned in this world. You know, sometimes the light can be abrasive, right? Like you're, you're sleeping and you're dreaming and the light starts shining in through your windows. Anybody ever want to get up and shut the curtains? Or, 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 the, or the alarm clock goes off and sometimes you want to slap the snooze button. That, that's true. Sometimes the light can be abrasive and sometimes the light of the truth is going to come into our lives and it's going to be abrasive. But you know what else? The light is also beautiful. I love waking up here and looking at the sunrise on Salinas Valley and watching as the colors and the hues change in the light of the rising sun. Friends, brothers and sisters, listen to me. The light of truth has dawned, and his name is Jesus. And everything we're looking for can be found in him. And that's good news. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the beauty of who you are, sending your son to show your love. Let us receive it and live in its truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Thank you, Shoreline. It's so good to be here.